Good morning. Uh, my name is Joe Benelli. I'm an associate extension educator with UConn Department of Extension. Uh, today's program is funded by uh, UConn Farm Risk Management uh, in cooperation with USDA Farm Risk Management Agency. Today's program will be on the FSA NAP program, provided FSA NAP program update presented by uh, uh, Sarah Fournier from, F from FSA. Sarah Fournier is, a, is an FSA program specialist. She has been with FSA for eight years, and of those has been a specialist in the state office for about four and a half years. This program is being recorded uh, for, for, future, for future reference. So if you have any other questions uh, after, after this presentation, feel free to, to log on to our, to our, to our site for, to review the, the material again, and all, like I said, and others that, that uh, could review the program too. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to, to Sarah. Sarah? Thank you, Joe. Um, good morning. As Joe said, my name is Sarah. I'm with the Farm Service Agency. Um, before I get into the presentation, I am going to turn off my camera just so I can make sure hopefully the presentation continues to work smoothly. All right. So, as Joe said, um, I'm going to be going over the non-insured crop disaster assistance program or NAP. The non-insured crop disaster assistance program or NAP provides financial assistance to producers of non-insurable crops when low yields, loss of inventory, or prevented planting occurs due to natural disasters. For NAP, producer means an owner, operator, landlord, tenant, or sharecropper who shares in the risk of producing a crop and who is entitled to a share in the crop available for marketing from that farm or would have been had the crop been produced. Landowners, landlords, tenants, contract growers, or anyone else not having a valid ownership share of the crop and who do not share in the risk of producing the crop are ineligible for NAP. The person or legal entity claiming to be the producer must be able to show with acceptable evidence that they had a valid commodity ownership share interest and control of the crop acreage on, on which the commodity was grown at the time of the disaster. Average adjusted gross income provisions do apply to NAP and to be eligible for payment Persons and entities, including the members of those entities, cannot have an average adjusted gross income that exceeds $900,000. CSAs are also eligible for NAP, specifically subscription-based CSAs, um, and that's because the amount the producer receives from their subscribers is not considered a guaranteed payment. So the definition of the subscription-based CSA, it's a farmer-driven operation where the farmer owns or leases the farm, they organize the CSA, they produce the farm products, and they recruit the customer members or subscribers. Eligible crops must be commercially produced agricultural commodities for which crop insurance is not available. Um, and they can be any of the following. So crops grown for food, crops planted and grown for livestock consumption, such as grain and forage crops, including native forage, crops grown for fiber, such as cotton and flax, but it does exclude trees, um, crops grown in a controlled environment, such as mushrooms and floriculture, specialty crops like honey and maple sap, sea oats and seagrass, sweet sorghum and biomass sorghum, industrial crops, including crops used in manufacturing or grown as feedstock for renewable biofuel, renewable electricity, or bio-based products, value loss crops such as aquaculture, Christmas trees, ginseng, ornamental nursery, and turf grass sod, 
and seed crops where the propagation stock is produced for sale as seed stock for other eligible nap crop production. Organic crops are also eligible for nap as long as the organic coverage option is selected. Um, the associated acreage is reported as organic and the required documentation has been provided to the county office indicating the crop's organic status. Producers reporting organic acreage of a crop must be certified or exempt from certification according to the National Organic Program regulations. Eligible causes of loss must occur in the coverage period before or during harvest and directly cause, accelerate, or exacerbate destruction or deterioration of that eligible crop. Eligible causes of loss include the following natural disasters. So damaging weather like drought, hail, excessive moisture, freeze, tornado, hurricane, excessive wind, lightning, and insufficient chill hours. It could be an adverse natural occurrence like an earthquake, flood, or volcanic eruption. Of those, most likely we'd only see the flood, hopefully. And conditions related to either the damaging weather or adverse natural occurrence like heat, insect infestation, disease, um, wildfires, those could also be eligible. Um, but related conditions need to have a primary cause of loss to be eligible for now. So insect, insect infestations wouldn't be eligible on their own they would have to have been caused by damaging weather or an adverse natural occurrence. This is just an overview of what the typical nap life cycle would look like. Um, and I'm gonna get into most of these items as we go through the presentation. So first I'll start with nap coverage. To be eligible for NAP coverage for a crop, a producer must file form CCC 471 or the Non-Insured Disaster Assistance Program application for coverage with buy-up option by the applicable application closing date for the crop. The CCC 471 must be filed by the producer for a specific administrative county and coverage options are selected by pay crop, pay type, and planting period. And this is also known as a pay group and we'll take a look at that in a moment. In Connecticut, the application closing dates are September 30th for garlic and value loss or controlled environment crops. That would be like your Christmas trees, sod and aquaculture. November 20th would be the deadline for orchard crops, forage, asparagus and cane berries. December 31st would be the deadline for maple sap and honey. And March 15th is basically everything else. So that's gonna be your spring seeded crops. So this is an example of what a pay group might look like. Um, in this table, there are two different pay groups. Um, and when you look at the pay crop, the combination of the pay crop and the pay type, that's what defines a pay group. Um, so pay group one would include the acorn, butternut, spaghetti, and winter squash, where pay group two would include the summer and the zucchini squash. Um, this is just another example. I'm not gonna list off all the different varieties um, but again, if you look at the combination of the pay crop and the pay type, um, this is how you would be able to identify uh, which crops fall into which pay groupings. So getting back into the coverage selection, NAP payments for low yield are calculated based on the amount of loss that exceeds the expected level of production. For basic coverage, 
the loss must exceed 50% of the expected production and it will be paid at 55% of the average market price. For buy-up coverage, the loss must be greater than 50%, 45%, 40%, or 35% of the expected yield, depending which buy-up option is selected. So our, it ranges from 50% to 65% as the coverage option. And that would be paid at 100% of the average market price. As mentioned before, the coverage levels are selected by the pay crop, pay type, and planting period, so the pay group. And if a producer is unsure what crops are included within a pay group, the county office has the ability to run a report that would identify um, what all those crops would be. So you don't have to guess at that for yourself. The county office can look that up. For producers who wish to buy to select buy up coverage, they must have at least one year of history of successfully growing the crop in the county where the coverage is being sought. Production of the crop is considered to be successful for yield based crops if the producer produced at least 50% of the county expected yield, unless that producer suffered a loss on that crop due to an eligible cause of loss. And for value loss crops, um, it would be considered successful if the producer has documentation to support at least 50% of the maximum dollar value being sought by the producer, again, unless they suffered an eligible loss. Proof of that successful growing history has to be submitted prior to the application closing date. And any producer not meeting that requirement would then be limited to the basic 5055 coverage level on that particular crop. For all coverage levels, the NAP service fee is the lesser of $325 per crop or $825 per producer per administrative county. The total service fee can't exceed $1,950 for producers that have farming interest in multiple counties. Like the coverage level selections, service fees are paid by the pay group in the administrative county, not by each individual crop selected within a pay group. Producers who elect buy-up coverage must also pay a premium fee. Premium fees are billed in January following the end of the coverage period. So for example, if buy-up coverage was selected for crop year 2022, a producer wouldn't see their premium bill until January of 2023. Maximum premium fee for a person or legal entity with buy-up coverage is $15,750 which is the maximum payment limitation times a 5.25% premium fee. If the NAP producer is a joint operation, the maximum premium fee would also be based on the number of persons or legal entities comprising that joint operation. And that's because each person within the operation would have their own um, payment lim limitation applied to them. Some producers may be eligible to receive a waiver or a reduction of the fees due. And to be eligible for either a waiver or of the service fee or a 50% premium reduction, producers must qualify as a beginning farmer, limited resource farmer, socially disadvantaged farmer, or a veteran farmer. The form CCC 860 would just have to be filed with the county office no later than the application closing date in order to receive either the waiver or the premium reduction.
Coverage periods for NAP vary and they will depend on the crop. Um, on this slide, these are the two most frequent categories of crops that we see here in Connecticut. Um, so we've got the, for the annual crop coverage, the coverage would begin the later of one day after the application for coverage is filed and the applicable service fee has been paid or the date the crop is planted, not to exceed the final planting date. And it would end the earlier of the date the crop harvest is complete, the normal harvest date for the crop, which is established by the FSA state committee, the date the crop is abandoned, or the date the entire crop acreage has been destroyed. And then we have um, perennial crop coverage. Um, it's similar to annuals, but just slightly different. So it would begin the later of one day after the application closing date, or one calendar day after the application for coverage has been filed and the applicable service fee has been paid. And then it would end the earlier of 10 months from the application closing date, the date the harvest is complete, the normal harvest date for the crop, the date the crop is abandoned, or the date the entire crop acreage has been destroyed. We also have a handful of value loss applications. Um, in most cases, the coverage period begins on October 1st and it would end on September 30th. For NAP and for most of our programs at FSA, um, producers are required to report on form FSA 578, all acres devoted to eligible crops in the administrative county by eligible crop type practice and intended use for each planting of the crop, including all of the crops by crop type selected on the application for coverage. Acreage must be reported before a notice of loss can be filed. Once a notice of loss has been filed, the reported acreage would then be verified as accurate by the county committee through the use of our loss adjusters before they would take action on any applications for payment. If discrepancies are discovered during this verification process, um, NAP acreage may be subject to variance rules depending on how great the discrepancy actually is. If acreage is determined to be out of variance, a partial or total loss of NAP, NAP benefits may occur. So the greater accuracy acreages are reported with upfront, the less likely it is that variance will apply. For each crop, which the acreage is reported on the FSA 578, and if it's covered by NAP, the producer must report production for that acreage by the application for payment deadline, if a notice of loss has been filed, or the later of the following, if a notice of loss hasn't been filed, which would be the subsequent year's acreage reporting deadline, or 60 calendar days after the normal harvest date for the crop. Production records are used to build a producer's actual production history, which establishes what their expected production level or approved yield would be for each crop year. This expected production level influences several things, and that would include the premium rates, what the loss threshold would be, and any potential payments. It's the producer's responsibility to report the total amount of unit production on forms containing the producer's signature and certification. When an application for payment is filed, verifiable production records must be submitted to substantiate the amount of production reported. Verifiable production records include contem contemporaneous records provided by the producer that are dated, show the disposition of the crop's production, including both the quantity and the price, and can be verified by FSA through an independent source. 
when submission of production records is required and verifiable records aren't available, non-verifiable records must be submitted for further review by the county committee. Non-verifiable records include, but aren't limited to, copies of receipts, cash regis register tapes, and UPIC records. When a crop or planting has been affected by a natural disaster, producers with NAP coverage should file Part B of Form CCC 576, which is the Notice of Loss and Application for Payment. Part B of the form documents a producer's loss or damage to a crop or commodity, as well as what has been or will be done with the crop acreage or commodity. Separate 576 Part B must be filed for each weather-related event or adverse natural occurrence that causes damage to or loss of a specific crop or commodity during the season. The CCC 576 Part B must be submitted for prevented planting claims within 15 days of the final planting date and for low yield claims and allowable value loss, the earlier of 15 calendar days after the disaster occurrence or a date of loss or damage to the crop first becomes apparent, or 15 calendar days after the normal harvest date. For hand harvested or rapidly deteriorating crops, Producers must notify FSA of damage or loss within 72 hours of the date damage or loss first becomes apparent. In Connecticut, this is a requirement for most of our crops. Um, producers can notify the county office by filing the notice of loss on that Part B of the 576. They can email details, facts, or phone in the details to the county office. Um, but for producers who provide notification by email, fax, or phone, will still be required to file the notice of loss on that Part B within 15 days of the loss becoming apparent. Um, information that should be provided at the time of notification include your name or the operations name, um, the unit affected, the crop affected, the apparent date of the loss, what the cause of loss is, what's going to be done with the damaged crop, and what has been done with the prevented planted or damaged crop. When an acceptable notice of loss has been filed, Loss adjusters would then be sent out to inspect and measure the damaged crop acreage. Damaged acreage must be left intact until the inspection can be completed. Um, any acreage destroyed or otherwise put to another use prior to a final inspection being completed may result in a reduction of NAP benefits. <clears throat> Loss adjusters, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Loss adjusters are essentially the county committee's eyes in the field. <clears throat> the notes and pictures submitted by the loss adjusters are used by the county committee when determining <clears throat> whether an application for payment should be approved or disapproved. After a loss adjuster completes their inspection, <clears throat> excuse me, Producers will have the opportunity to review form CCC 576-1. This form contains the acreage determinations and production appraisals completed by the loss adjuster. Producers will then sign the completed form indicating either their concurrence or disagreement with the information entered by the loss adjuster. If a producer disagrees with the measurements completed by the loss adjuster, Additional information will need to be provided by the producer indicating what they disagree with in specific and how their appraisal method would differ from the method used by the loss adjuster.
NAP participants with an approved notice of loss on file must also be able to show to the county committee that they had the ability and intent to harvest, transport, and market the quantity of their approved yield or inventory. It is the NAP participant's obligation to show to FSA's satisfaction that absent the claimed eligible loss condition, the crop for which payment is sought would have been marketed commercially. To receive NAP benefits, producers would have to complete form CCC 576 parts D through H as applicable. This part of the form is also known as the application for payment. A complete application must be filed no later than 60 calendar days after the coverage period ends for the crop. County committees do have the authority to grant extensions to this deadline up to an additional 120 days if circumstances merit approval. Any producers seeking an extension to the deadline must submit their request in writing no later than 180 calendar days after the coverage period has ended. The CCC 576 parts D through H are considered filed when both of the following apply. Part H has been signed by the producer and the form is accompanied by all required documentation for the unit, including but not limited to an acceptable report of acreage, an acceptable notice of loss, acceptable production evidence, and any other documentation and information necessary for the county committee to determine the correct payment amount. One thing to note, the application for payment must include the total acres and harvested production for all crops within a pay group. As we saw in the pay group example earlier, summer and zucchini squash are both in the same pay group. So if someone grows both types of squash, but only the summer squash, let's say, was affected by a disaster, the loss and payment calculations will look at the overall acreage and production for both types of squash to determine whether a payment will be due. This slide is an overview of how the payments are calculated. So for yield-based crops, we would be looking at the eligible acres, um, the producer's share of the crop, the approved yield, um, times the coverage level percentage, and that would give you the disaster level. And then you would take your disaster level and you would subtract what your harvested production actually was and that will give you your net production for payment. Then you would take uh, the net production for payment, multiply it by the applicable market price, um, times the price coverage percentage, and the payment factor minus any salvage value, and that would give you your NAP payment. Um, for value loss crops, it's slightly different. Um, so you would take the smaller of your actual field market value, A, or the producer selected maximum dollar value times your coverage level. That would give you your disaster level. You would take your disaster level, subtract the field market value B, which is basically what your inventory would be after the loss occurred, and that gives you your crop loss. Um, you would multiply that by the producer share, any unharvested factor, and the price coverage percentage, and that will give you your NAP payment for value loss. Um, these are our county offices that are located in Connecticut. Um, since you may not have time to write down exactly what your information is, um, you can also locate the contact information for your local service center, either in Connecticut or if you have land outside of Connecticut, the website along the bottom will take you there. Um, Farmers.gov has a lot of good program information um, that can help producers besides just the locations of service centers. Um, 
so yeah, that concludes my presentation for today. I guess we can open it up for questions now. Well, thank thank you, Sarah, uh, very much for your for your excellent presentation. Again, uh, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to to put that in the chat box now as we speak. And and uh, I just wanted I had a question uh, for for you, Sarah. If there are any other questions that that arise, you know, after this meeting or as as maybe as as uh, producers and farmers view online, would it could they you know send an email uh, directly to a, a county office? How would that work for follow up information if they want follow specific follow up information? Um, it would be best to reach out to their local county office. Um, and like I said before. Um, they can reach out by phone. I believe email addresses are available online as well. Um, we have our program staff that's very knowledgeable. So our county executive directors and our program technicians. Um, so somebody within the county office would definitely be able to help. Okay. Well, well, thank you, Sarah. One more thing. I would, I would, uh, part of our, of our program, our funding from the funder also requires us to do to, to evaluate our programming. Uh, to, to determine whether or not our programming is effective, uh, and there's a you know as well. So I'm wondering, uh, uh, Francis, if you're able to post uh, the, the evaluation online uh, for us to to complete, and anyone who's remaining online, if they could please complete the Slido evaluation, that would be very much appreciated. Again, uh, it's important to get feedback on our programming to assure that basically that our programming is is effective, has value to our growers and farmers throughout Connecticut. Uh, as well, so upon completion of the of the evaluation, uh, you uh, uh, you can you can log off. But again, we certainly appreciate you for being on on the program today, uh, and good luck uh, here. Kind of cold. We're getting some snow this this today or tomorrow, I guess, or Saturday, and and uh, hope you're all safe uh, as as well. Again, thank you so much, Sarah, for your excellent 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 presentation.